Welcome everyone to our next session on West Africa. Thank you, Ariana, and our former panelists for what you did. And uh, now I am Claire Majasek, and I am working for UNCDF at the regional office in Dakar. And uh, I am working on financial inclusion and the youth portfolio in five countries in West Africa, which are the Gambia, Guinea, Niger, Senegal, and Ghana. So now we are talking about skills development in the digital era with my three partners. Thank you very much to be with us today. Uh, let me introduce them quickly. So first, Kodu, can you talk about us, you a little, please? Thank you, Claire. Hello, everyone. My name is Kodu Njai. I am a project manager at Maggi. We are a tech company building mobile solutions for data collection. Um, we've been working the past years with on implementing um, projects on financial education and other um, other sectors uh, in like agriculture. Um, and I'm happy to be here today. Thank you very much, Kadu. Uh, then, Dave, please. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Dave Emnitz, uh, co-founder and chief operations officer at Oze. Uh, Oze is a fintech that's based in Ghana, but it has operations across West Africa. And our mission at Oze is to help small businesses grow. And we do that by helping them tackle two of their main challenges, uh, financial record keeping uh, and access to capital. Uh, and so we're working with UNCDF uh, to bring our small business software to 10,000 small businesses across Ghana uh, and help them build good habits around financial record keeping uh, and help them access small business loans. Uh, very excited to be uh, on the panel here today with my colleagues and, and Claire. Thank you very much, Dave. Very excited too. And so now, last but not least, Raymond, please. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Raymond Moser. I'm the representative of the International Trade Center in the Gambia. ITC is the joint organization of the United Nations and the World Trade Organization. And we support small businesses in becoming more competitive and also accessing markets, international value chains, but also domestically. Very, very happy to be here with you this afternoon. Thank you very much, Raymond. So as you can see, both uh, the three panelists are partners in different countries and uh, that is very interesting for our discussion on skills development since we, we are working together but on different ways in each of uh, their countries. Uh, so first uh, let us talk about uh, a little um, of the idea of how to reach uh, people and even more about how to reach the last mile uh, that is to say how to be more inclusive. But in the same uh, way, it is uh, very important to know the potential of the digital, but also not to forget uh, that there is a risk of exclusion. Uh, so first, uh, Raymond, can you talk a little about your idea on that and how you work on it uh, directly in the Gambia? Right, yes. Um, so perhaps to uh, get us going a little bit on the discussion on skills and digital, I would like to maybe first zoom in on the overall objective of uh, skills development and particularly also what we're trying to do from a development perspective. So what are the objectives when we talk about uh, supporting skills development for both uh, soft skills as well as uh, hard skills or vocational, technical vocational skills? Um, I'd like to think about them in three areas, really. Um, number one, we need to, of course, look at relevance, right? With relevance, we understand um, how fit for purpose is a skills area for what is intended to do. So whether you are aiming to become uh, self-employed, starting your own venture, having your own startup, or whether you're looking for employment afterwards. Uh, it's important that um, the topic that is being taught is, is relevant and is market-led. Um, the second area of uh, importance, again, for the skills uh, agenda overall is, is quality. So, yes, areas need to be relevant, but equally important it is that um, training is of good quality. 
that it is uh, state of the art knowledge, that the trainers themselves have a good understanding of the topic. They are able to talk about the topic from a technical viewpoint, but obviously also have the, uh, the right uh, skills themselves when it comes to delivering uh, specific uh, training uh, services. And um, last but not least, um, what is important is access. So particularly uh, I'm in the Gambia where we also have a very strong concentration of skills centers, both again for soft skills and hard skills in the urban areas, particularly in greater Banjul area. And um, when we talk about access, we of course uh, want to make sure that the services are being offered uh, across the length of the country. So how do we make sure that um, whatever we do, whatever the training institutions, uh, skills training services, TVETs, business support organizations are accessible for anybody in the country who, who needs that sort of support. Um, so these are three areas and of course you would say that these are areas that um, apply to digital as much as they apply to uh, brick and mortar approaches. But I think when we talk about digital, I just want us to kind of keep in mind that these are sort of overall broad objectives that you're pursuing when it comes to these different service uh, offerings. Now, specifically for uh, online training, digital solutions in the area of skills training, there are a couple of important implications and where digital can be a real game changer. And maybe first talking about access, uh, I mean, of course, it's uh, fairly straightforward to think about like um, digital dissemination of information uh, in terms of what is available and how you can benefit and what um, you know uh, is most uh, relevant to your respective needs, whether you are a company, whether you're an individual, digital plays a very important role. And um, there we not necessarily itself talking about um, sophisticated integrated learning platforms, but uh, simple channels as well that just help also disseminate information. Um, in the Gambia, we're looking a lot at Facebook, social media at large uh, for sharing information. I think here, of course, access to or, or using digital means has, has an important impact when it comes to actually uh, providing access to, to different training opportunities. Uh, again, whether it's skills uh, in terms of locations or whether it's soft skills and um, entrepreneurship or business development related support. Um, but then equally on, on other areas when it comes to um, the quality or the relevance of the training, um, the digital uh, agenda can also have an important dimension in terms of uh, transformation. And um, here again, I will maybe look at it from two angles. One is uh, using digital solutions to improve the operational efficiencies of the um, training service providers themselves. And I think that's where we have seen quite a lot of also interesting changes over the last couple of months uh, with, with um, the uh, health and social economic crisis where um, this has been a catalyst for really um, improving digital means within organizations to improve uh, the way that they operate and um, so this can take forms in terms of measuring results where uh, an institution has a more sort of data driven and digital approach to uh, looking at how do they integrate data and how to make use of data when it comes to the, the impact that they're achieving as well. Uh, but it's also interesting for, for us, as um, obviously for, from the perspective where we sit uh, as development uh, partners, uh, to kind of have more access to this, to the information. Of course, before impact assessment or results measurement was always part of the work. Um, where digital kind of has an impact is also when it comes to really the speed for which we are able to get this information, the comprehensiveness, uh, the accuracy, but also integrating this data with different dimensions. So I'll give you one example, like um, in the Gambia, we are implementing an initiative, uh, UNCDF together with ITC, that brings together different dimensions, skills training, but also cash for work and also access to finance. And what it does, um, having digital approaches in this, it really allows us to, for instance, combine impact assessment in terms of employability after skills training with other economic indicators. So for instance, we can combine that with the information we have on mobile money and uh, savings information that go through um, the different uh, clients that we're working with 
and see how that then impacts their economic standing, their uh, prospects in the job market, uh, and so on. But also it has um, um, important, interesting applications that we have seen over the last couple of months when it comes to not just one institution, but also ecosystem at large. Right. I think one of the initiatives that I'm quite excited about here in the Gambia is that we are having ecosystem initiatives where we are working on a CRM, not for one institution, but for a whole ecosystem of business support organizations that work in the same data platforms for measuring the results and aggregating results of the clients that they're working with, in this case, small businesses. And of course, that helps to improve efficiencies in terms of actual impact. But equally, it is also um, very relevant in terms of fine tuning the services that an institution offers because they are much more aware of what do the clients need when it comes to also COVID response, COVID recovery, etc. And they're able to come up with more bespoke services. So these are some areas that I would see largely sort of at an overall ecosystem initiative where we have seen some very interesting forms of application when it comes to uh, digital solutions to, to the skills training uh, agenda. Over to you, Claire. Thank you very much, Raymond. It was really nice uh, to have your point and uh, to remind us of the objectives of uh, upskilling and reskilling our beneficiaries. And uh, I also appreciate a lot you talking about the program we are doing together in the Gambia and the idea of uh, doing it with the all ecosystem. Uh, it is very nice. Thank you. Um, so now maybe we can go to Dave, uh, because we also have a kind of uh, a similar program in Ghana with you. Uh, I know it is uh, most early uh, for the implementation in Ghana, but please talk about it. Sure. Uh, thanks, Claire, very much. Uh, I want to kind of uh, dial back to kind of your original question about reach. And I think uh, it's really important for us to think about things, especially uh, for for our, for our company, we have a, a smartphone app, right? Um, but not everyone has a smartphone, uh, so it's really important to think about. And we kind of think about uh, our users in in two different segments: those who have a smartphone and those who don't. Um, so let, let's talk about those who have a smartphone to start. Uh, it's really important to think about how can you make your your application or the software that you're providing uh, uh, available offline. So how can you make sure that it has offline capabilities? Uh, our app, for example, works offline, and then many of our users will connect once a week to upload their data to the cloud. So the first thing is, is offline capabilities. The second thing I would say is application size. So uh, a lot of uh, our users don't have very much space uh, on their phone, or they're trying to compare the value they get from one app to another app and decide, okay, which one do I keep on my phone? So it's very important to look at your app size and see uh, how can you compress that down uh, to a small enough um, a small enough size that it, that it, that it, it works for the user's phone. Uh, another thing we look at is how can we make uh, the application as simple as possible, um, right? Because um, the users have different levels of tech literacy. Uh, so uh, while some of our users may use WhatsApp all the time, they may have never used any other uh, application. And unfortunately, just because they use WhatsApp doesn't necessarily mean that they can use another app. Um, so it's very important to, especially when you're looking at the onboarding process um, of some of our users starting to use these digital products, uh, making sure that uh, it's designed in such a way that's intuitive uh, and that you're really kind of doing a little bit of handholding, uh, making sure that you're explaining how to use things going forward. Um, so th those are some of the things that uh, we looked at when we designed our app to make sure that uh, we had that reach to make sure that those who have smartphones um, were able to to use the app. Uh, and I'll touch quickly about some some things we're experimenting with for uh, users who may not have a smartphone. Uh, so there's um, technologies with USSD. Uh, there's technologies with voice user interface uh, that you can use uh, to um, help users who um, you know, may not have a smartphone, begin to uh, think about uh, how to use a digital product like ours. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, so it, for, for our app, it's a business app where users can record their sales and expenses. Uh, if we were to integrate voice user interface, uh, the user could speak and say, um, I sold uh, three tomatoes at a price of three CDs today to Kwaku Mensa, for example. Uh, and that could 
uh, pull the transaction right into the app uh, and would be great for record keeping. Uh, so there's 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 a lot of new technologies that we can start to think about uh, so that we can really access people uh, as we say at that at that last mile. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll pause there and, and throw it back over to uh, Kodu or, or Claire to, to keep going. Thank you very much, Dave, and it was very interesting to know the way you are doing it in Ghana and with the aspect of having or not a smartphone, which is indeed very important and can be a risk of exclusion. So thank you to sharing that with us. And so now we are going to Kodu. And uh, she's the last because she's working with us in four of our countries already. And she has a large view of how to deal with our beneficiaries and how to reach them. Kodu, it's you. Thank you, Claire. Um, so I'll just echo on what uh, Dave just said. Um, when we are building the, the system, uh, to give just a little bit of context, we are trying to build a, a mobile application for financial education um, for the beneficiaries of the different uh, country we are working with. Um, it's Senegal, Gambia, Guinea, Niger, and soon uh, Ghana. So uh, one thing that is really important, uh, as they've mentioned it, for which is uh, being able to have an application which will work offline. We know that um, in our regions, um, connectivity can sometimes be an issue. So building an app or um, having a tool which can work offline can be um, very um, critical. Um, one other thing that uh, should be taken into account is also um, the usability and how the app will respond to the need of both the beneficiary and also the one who are uh, the, the partners who are actually um, um, using the program to evaluate things um, um, and monitor those beneficiaries. So the, the app we are trying to build um, is very user uh, centric. So we are trying to understand the need of the users and make sure that we build the app that will um, be useful to them and, and help them. Uh, for, the, 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 for instance, the, the agent of the, the partners we are working with will be using the application to do group trainings, for instance, for the beneficiaries. We need to make sure that like the app will allow them to do their job better but not replace the agent. Sometimes technology would be here to help, but it cannot replace the, the human. As um, Raymond said it, um, it is important to have like uh, the proper training for the people who will be um, actually conducting those um, uh, transfers of knowledge to the beneficiaries of the programs. So uh, we, it is important um, to have a tool that will help them do their job at, at best. And um, another thing is, um, as I was saying, it having it user centric um, ha in our communities to make sure that like we are using a lot of multimedias because as Dave said it, some people might be using WhatsApp, but it's going to be difficult for them to use another application. So um, for instance, in some of these apps we are working, we are built, trying to build, we are using a lot of multimedia in local languages to make sure that like uh, people will understand the type of messages we want to um, convey and also make it as easy as, and as possible and simple for the usage of um, the beneficiaries. And also the usage, for instance, of multimedia will um, will allow the both the, the trainers and also people, um, beneficiaries who are able to have smartphone and use the app for themselves or even like people within their communities because we are considering them as ambassadors um, to be able to, um, to reach um, a broader audience, for instance, people who are illiterate uh, or not tech literate. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much. Thank you, Kudu. I liked how you are talking about having a user-centric application that is indeed very important and to understand the needs of the beneficiaries 
and that is indeed the way to better reach the, the last mile. And also, as you said, and Raymond too, it is important to have this innovative technological tool to help, but it cannot always replace humans. So that leads us to our next question, which is more about how to implement and to deliver your services. Um, so please talk about it. And also if you can give us more details about your services, for instance, your application for Dave and Kodu and Raymond, a little more about what kind of training you are doing in the Gambia. Uh, so now let's change, please, Dave. Sure. Um, yeah, so let me start by just giving you a little more information about uh, our business app. Uh, so right now our business app is available on web app, uh, Android and iOS. Uh, and what it allows small business owners to do is record their sales and expenses, uh, track who they owe money to uh, and who owes them money. More importantly, everyone wants to know who owes them money. Uh, it gives them a dashboard to see how their business is performing, how their business is trending over time. Uh, allows them to receive payment reminders when someone owes them and to send payment reminders to the customer. Um, so th those are some of the core functions. Uh, the other thing that's I think really interesting about our app is it provides just-in-time business education uh, and access to a business coach. Um, so uh, I think a, uh, a lot of our, our users, sometimes they just want to talk over a business strategy with someone who's done it before, who started a business before. Uh, or um, they, they want to know uh, how to do a, a particular accounting formula, right? So some of these questions um, are very important uh, and can be answered simply over WhatsApp uh, through our business coach. Uh, and then we also send uh, our daily business tips. Uh, so that's what I'm talking about in terms of just-in-time education, um, sending our, our tips to our customers on a, on a, on a daily basis. Um, and, and the reason we do that is because sometimes and I, I'd be curious to kind of uh, hear Raymond and Cody's opinion on this, but sometimes when you, we've done mm, like week long entrepreneurship trainings in the past, uh, and we're, we're throwing so much information uh, at, at people that sometimes they, they don't come away with all that much. Um, so uh, we're, we're experimenting and we're trying to find ways to, uh, how do we provide just the right amount of information uh, so that the person really internalizes that and goes and takes that back to their business uh, and tries to implement it. Um, uh, and so that's kind of what we're experimenting with, with the um, uh, just-in-time education. Um, and I think it, it's it's important uh, as we think about implementation and, and support to think about uh, how we can introduce hybrid models. Uh, so a little bit of in-person uh, and a little bit of, of digital or online. Um, and uh, we're, we're experimenting with a bunch of different models there, but uh, I'd be curious to hear other people's thoughts on it as well. Yeah, um, I think that to echo on just what you, you said, um, one particular example came to mind um, on, the, on the, the financial education projects. For instance, in Guinea, they were um, building, they were doing group trainings. And then when COVID happened, um, the group training, we need to change actually the, 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 the strategy. And we had to, um, to rebuild the, 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 the the individual financial education app to allow the beneficiaries to do self-training. Mm -hmm. But then um, one thing that we tried to implement as well was to be able to, to, to avoid to have them like complete all the sessions at once. So uh, each session was blocked to a given time where like when you complete, for instance, one session, you'll have to wait a day or two, I don't remember, to be able to complete the second one. And then we put into place some quizzes to make sure that like um, after they completed the different courses, once they complete those quizzes, we will be able to know if actually they understood what they've learned before and have a system of scoring to like, um, let's say if they uh, have a less than, 80% will ask them to review um, the courses and retake the test. And I think that it's really important um, to not just um, do the whole transfer of knowledge at once because we all, we are humans. We sometimes we need to have time to process things. And also when we are doing group activities, the learning path 
is different from one person to another. So it is really important to make sure that like um, we have time to process the, the information. Yeah, uh, I totally agree with you, Kodu. Um, I think another thing that's important, and, and I really like the way you 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 spaced out the um, the the transfer of knowledge, and then did a quiz, uh, and then did another transfer of knowledge, and then did a quiz. I think it's it's a great model. It's something we've been experimenting with as well. Um, I, I'd be curious. Uh, something we're also trying to think about a lot is how do we create um, a community? Uh, so you have uh, a a cohort or a group of people who are all going through this same transfer of knowledge, uh, maybe at the same time, but at different paces. Um, and so we, we've experimented a lot with, with WhatsApp groups. Um, how do we put all of those people in the same WhatsApp group? Um, and, and, and thinking about this from operational efficiency as well, you, you sometimes have uh, other uh, people in the cohort answering questions where the admins don't have to answer the question. But just in general, creating that community where people can support each other as they're going through this training, I think is a very, very important aspect uh, of, of what we're doing. Um, well, uh, I find this very interesting, this this experimentation of like hybrid models, as you call it. And I mean, I almost think of it as, as two forms of hybrid, right? I mean, before when we were talking about blended learning, we often meant that there is like sort of an online delivery mechanism through which uh, we are uh, sharing content, right? Sometimes it's automated, but then you also have like a in-person or a in um uh, uh, an additional element of coaching or you have a facilitator who also comes in and there is an element of interactive um, learning where you can also customize the content to 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 your client right and um, I think um, they've now a big push towards like more digitizing content in all forms and shape I think we also see other forms of hybrid where we are uh, using also combining different technologies and I think in terms of trying to answer to your uh, question, what works? Um, I mean, it's, it's it's really challenging to kind of answer it in in, in one um, sort of uh, kind of boilerplate way because um, it so much depends on on your client and the specific context and the platform that you're using for sharing the content. Whether you're using mobile devices, whether you're using a laptop, whether you're using um, you know, uh, uh, whatever technology also is, is being in, uh, in, in place. So, um, but I think what um, has worked well for us as well is like to uh, combine these different technologies that you have, let's say, you know, a channel of sharing information or passing on knowledge and then combining it with a also, um, sometimes we work with community leaders or youths who are in that community who might be um, playing that role of uh, sort of community lead online as well as offline who already have a history of convening and bringing people together and um, I think whether it's at the level of a community or village we often have these people who have maybe also a certain level of authority or respect that they can use for this um, when it is about you know getting people on a platform or helping also others to connect and I find that is quite an interesting approach to then use uh, sort of offline structures and certain way of organizations that have worked well in a completely um, non-digital setting, right? Um, for instance, uh, in, in the Gambia, we have, um, uh, we are doing uh, a lot of work on tourism response and recovery and a big push there, it's in terms of digital, preparing um, the companies and the tour operators and the hotels to be more present in the digital space. And um, so we have camps upriver as well, who previously were dependent entirely on tour operators who brought the tourists and they did not have any digital footprint whatsoever. And now the question is, how do we get them to be, be more visible themselves? And so for instance, there is trainings that we're offering in terms of how do you adjust your business models to that digital era, being present on, you know, filling the blank, TripAdvisor, et cetera, or having your own website and, and being out there and engaging with your clients. But then, um, how do you share that content in the first place, right? And so, for instance, what we found quite useful is that we're working with a group of uh, tourist uh, guides, a young tourist guide association, who has been sort of become leaders in many different other aspects. They were even the first responders when it came to COVID 
and making sure they're in place. But then they also became the same leaders when it came to the digital literacy training, because they were then able to kind of get the different uh, operators, share, create that sort of community. And basically the point I'm trying to make is here, using sort of uh, structures or group or community dynamics that were there before and almost digitizing those, you know, creating sort of a vis-a-vis -vis in the digital world and through that also, um, you know, using that to leverage the, 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 the channeling or the, um, the passing on of, of, of messages. So that has worked quite well uh, for, for us and, and I think it's an interesting uh, approach as well. Dave, you're on mute. I totally was. I, I had a, this really great point that I was about to come out with, and then I. <laughs> uh, no, I think it's a really, really interesting point, Raymond. Um, how can you use the community dynamics, uh, the community leaders that are already in place um, to deliver digital solutions or to digitize um, what's already existing there? Um, and, and I think uh, just to add on a little bit to that, uh, it's really important to, to look for, um, in our case, the groups of entrepreneurs that already exist. Um, so I'll give you an example. There's a group in Ghana called the, the Mompreneurs. Uh, and it's th this, this group of moms who are all running businesses. Uh, and so they have that kind of, that, that shared um, a sense of what it's like to uh, not only <laughs> be taking care of your kids, uh, getting them to school, um, but uh, also running a business at the same time. Uh, and so uh, we started working with that group. And what we found is that as soon as one person started to use our product or adopted our digital solution, uh, without us having to do anything, uh, all of a sudden 10, 15, 20 of the other people in the group were also doing the same thing. Um, so uh, it's, I think it's an, it's an interesting strategy, but also um, a way to, um, how do you disseminate these digital solutions quickly by using uh, organizations that already exist? One thing I was curious about as well for um, you, uh, your companies uh, who are at the forefront of coming up with sort of innovative solutions. Um, what I find interesting in, in the digital service delivery is um, you almost have like a twofold approach when it comes to customizing solutions, right? I mean, us in sort of as, as economists, we typically group our clients in different segments uh, based on their economic maturity. We talk about micro companies, small size, uh, where are they in a value chain? What is the level of sophistication when it comes to financial products that they need, access to market, access to information, uh, quality, product development, you name it, right? And um, we then develop like solutions according to those specific needs for a economic operator, right? Now, in the digital sort of space, you almost have like a second level as well, right? Which is the, um, what, what you call the human-centered approach, where you might have like a very sophisticated company, but the users may not have that sort of literacy when it comes to digital, right? and able to kind of consume the solutions. So you kind of need to kind of customize economically a solution, but you also have that sort of human interface that may not correspond to the level of sophistication of the company, right? You may have like a startup or that has a very basic, um, uh, let's say company at this point, but um, is digitally very literate and very capable and um, you have vice versa. So, so I was wondering in like sort of your product development stage, how do you sort of combine or marry these two um, lenses or profiles of, of users? I mean, how do you bring them together and, and how does that come out at the end of, of the product development stage? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting question, Raymond. Um, it's, it's difficult, right? Um, designing a, a product or a digital solution for uh, kind of like the way I split them up earlier was people who have smartphones and people who don't have smartphones um, it is, is very difficult and you almost have to come out with uh, two different products. Um, but uh, I think in the design process and we use a human centered design approach, um, 
it's it's all about co-creating uh, the the product with the user. Uh, so there's a lot of workshops and co-creation workshops that you do with the user. Uh, you take them through a series of exercises to understand uh, if they were the one developing the solution, how would they develop it? What would be best suited for them? Uh, and sometimes uh, it's interesting to have uh, people from both of those groups in the same session. So people who have a smartphone and those who don't have a smartphone and you see kind of the two different solutions that they develop together. Uh, and then maybe you come up with something that's in the middle or maybe you decide you have to develop two different products because the, the groups are just at such a different level of either tech literacy or um, uh, just have different solutions in mind that that's, that's the, that what you have to go with. Um, but it, it's I, I would say it's tough uh, and it's really important to just work as closely as you can with the people that you're developing the solution for. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, so maybe we can finish on the third aspect we want to discuss today. And it is more about considering uh, the operation consideration. You know, how to really uh, do with our programs that we are implementing in the countries, how to deal with some uh, issues with the reality of the ground. And so maybe we can start with Raymond, since I know that the GSF program is on for a long time now, and you had to deal with many things, but you were able to do a great job. So please talk about it. Uh, right, I mean, maybe to kind of introduce that, um, solutions or, or JSF that we are doing is in, in the Gambia, we work um, a lot on, on, on job creation, right? And um, when, it, when we talk about job creation, of course, uh, projects or development partners, they do not create jobs, the private sector that create jobs. But I think there's three main avenues that we can use to facilitate that process. And um, one is, of course, um, you know, helping um, the clients to acquire a skill that make them employable, so improving the prospects of the job market, going into whatever sector and, and, and picking up a job. The other one is like um, starting your own business, and I think that's um, obviously uh, the situation of many um, of our clients because the private sector is not that small, or there's the formal jobs are simply not there, and so we often talk about them as entrepreneurs, but maybe it's a different form of entrepreneurship that goes in there as well. We not just talk about like sort of creating a startup, but also just freelancing and finding your own job and so on. But then the third aspect, of course, in terms of job creation is to support small businesses uh, to grow, become more competitive and in the process, of course, also add more jobs, interesting jobs, better jobs and um, using that sort of more trajectory of business growth to help the economy to grow as, as, as a whole. Um, of course, there's multiple things that need to come in here when it comes to um, uh, pursuing this uh, job uh, development or support agenda. And um, I'm not saying that we're working on, on, on all of it, but uh, on a number of things. And in the case of the job skills and finance project uh, that we're doing here in the Gambia, um, this one has a strong focus on young Gambians and uh, women. So we are looking at uh, particularly those uh, constituencies. We're looking at uh, jobs upriver, and we're also looking at the green economy. So we're looking at uh, areas in terms of job creation that are forward looking, that are progressive, that are also the jobs of the, of, of the future. And, um, you know, one single intervention doesn't do really um, uh, bring about the change that we want to achieve necessarily. So we need to bring different things together. And um, so, for instance, what we're combining is entrepreneurship support, skills training, with also cash for work. So using almost like public works initiative to kind of create a demand for the skills that help then people to put this into practice and also support the development of infrastructure that is needed for actually kickstarting a certain also local ecosystem, right? And then we have the aspects related to access to finance, which will help those who actually um, have gone through, let's say, a skills training to grow become uh, also bigger operators and but also in the longer run uh, help the whole uh, financial inclusion agenda in terms of making sure that um, the, um, the, the, the the benefits remain. And, and then there are, of course, when it comes to the digital agenda specifically, there are these elements where we try to integrate that. And I think that's really interesting for us also from a sort of 
measuring impact and results where I've briefly mentioned it before when we look at um, how does a skills training program not just look, uh, look at, you know, what are the benefits in terms of uh, skills or human capital at large, but also how does that tie into other economic indicators like, you know, income generation, savings, um, accessing mobile money and then bringing these different indicators together and having a more comprehensive view of how does that ha how does that bring about you know changes um, to the individuals to the uh, local ecosystem in terms of companies and, and and entrepreneurs so and and of course in that if you have specific um, targets or specific clients that you want to service in this case um, young Gambians and women in the rural economy there are certain things we need to be mindful really about how do we deliver these services to these constituencies in an inclusive way? Because I think some of the challenges that you have mentioned before in terms of making sure that people can really benefit from that, they're very, they're very obvious in, in, in this context. Thank you very much, Raymond. It was very interesting and uh, very uh, helpful to know better about the GSF program and what you are doing. And indeed, uh, most of the challenges you tackled are very important to consider. And maybe we can know more about uh, what Dave thinks about it. Since uh, you are at an early stage in the program, what do you think of what Raymond talked about? Can there be like uh, good lessons for you? And how will you tackle some issues you will meet? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Raymond. Um, I I think, um, you know, Raymond was right on the money. I really like the way that you broke down uh, the different aspects of job creation, um, you know, learning skills to be able to get a better job or, or a job, uh, starting your own business or supporting small businesses to create more jobs. Um, I think those are definitely uh, the three main areas and we need to think about all of them uh, as we look to implement our projects. Um, I think one thing that's 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 interesting is just, just thinking about how our different organizations can work together as we implement these projects. Uh, so, uh, for example, in our project in Ghana, uh, Jose is working with Echo Bank uh, to deliver our solution. Um, and I think rather than, you know, uh, competing uh, to, to develop uh, competing uh, solutions or competing projects, um, it's, it's much more beneficial for us to work together on some of these things. Um, so, uh, I think uh, I'm really excited as we start our project to see how that we how we can work to, with Echo Bank uh, in order to deliver our solution that way. Thank you very much, Dave. And um, talking more about Ghana and how you will be working with Echo Bank is very interesting too. Uh, and last, Kodu, I know that we are working together in five in four countries and we have different issues depending on the countries and the partners. So please just talk about one or two stories that you can share with us. Oh, you are on mute. Yes, sorry. Um, I think that uh, in in our situation it's a little bit different in a way that um, we are trying to build this tool for for different stakeholders, uh, and the reality on the on each country is different. Sometimes one of the challenges we are mostly facing is aligning um, the partners. Um, how can I say it? Uh, requirement and needs to be able to get to a product that is um, uh, viable. Uh, because um, right now we are going to extend to, to Ghana, so we are definitely going to need to capitalize on the work we have already completed in, in other countries. So yeah, I think one of the most challenging parts are like the stakeholder management and uh, um, the, the, how can I say, their, manage their expectations to make sure to to get to like uh, one product that will be uh, satisfying to all of them. And also for the beneficiaries of those different things. Thank you very much, Kadu, and I do share your difficulties most of the time. It is indeed uh, kind of difficult to work with all the stakeholders uh, while, while they have different backgrounds. And it is also uh, using a good tool with digital 
Uh, but as we already said, we have to be careful on digital literacy, uh, which is very important uh, for our beneficiaries, but also for our partners altogether, since we don't have all the same level. So we just have five minutes left, uh, so I will uh, let you one minute each to maybe do a conclusion or to share one thing that is uh, a key concept for you, and then I will do the overall conclusion. Uh, so please, Kodou. Okay, I'll go first. Um, so I think that like one thing that I um, would say is more about um, the design process and how we should be um, centering it over the, the, the end beneficiaries and how we should be um, producing um, a product or building a product that will be suitable to them and will allow them to build their skills on one hand and on the other hand on the on the partner's perspective to make sure that like we we provide to them the the, the tools that they need to also um, transfer that that knowledge in the best way um, to the to the beneficiaries of the program because at the end of the day um, they are the, um, the 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 people that we are doing this work for and to make sure that like it will be valuable for them in the future. Thank you, Kodu, and I do totally share with you the idea that we need value added and we need what we are doing to be useful for people in the future. And I think we are doing it together. Thanks. Uh, what about you, Dave? Yeah, thanks, Claire. Um, I, I think one thing that, that kind of stands out for me as we're all trying to um, develop these digital solutions or uh, pair digital solutions with uh, an in-person model uh, is is kind of the, the two things that stand out to me uh, when, when we've been developing our product is to make sure that we really nail uh, what we call the first time user experience uh, or the onboarding experience. Uh, because that's the moment where the person decides, is this worth my time or not? Um, should I spend my time trying to figure out how to use this digital solution, trying to uh, learn uh, from the people who are providing uh, me this? Uh, so that's the first thing that you need to really nail and, and, and figure out um, uh, just how to do that really well. Uh, and then I think the, the other moment is uh, when the, the person realizes the value that they're getting from the digital solution. Uh, so in the beginning, they might not realize that uh, they think they're going to get value from it, but it's when they really start to, they have that kind of aha moment that, oh, this digital solution taught me this. Um, so how can we support uh, the, the user until they get to that point in their journey? Um, and I'll give you an example. With our product, a lot of times it's uh, the first time they send a digital receipt uh, and the customer message back to them, oh, your business is really professional. This, this is amazing, right? Uh, and they have that, oh, I'm getting a lot of value out of this product that I'm using. Uh, let's see what other value I can get out of that product. Uh, so I, I think those are the two points um, that are really important to focus on as you're developing digital solutions um, and making sure that they're they're really benefiting uh, the people that you're working with. Thank you very much, Dave. And uh, I do share your ID. It's very important to take care of the first time the user will use and be onboarding. And also, as you added, uh, the value added of our product. And uh, it is also very nice when you have beneficiaries that can tell you the story you just told us. And uh, I'm sure we will do a great job together in Ghana and have lots of story like that to tell. OK, so now to finish, Raymond, you begin and now you will finish, please. Thanks for the honors. Um, perhaps the, the, the one thing that I would like to uh, stress um, once more and it has I think we, we discussed about it a couple of times or, or we, on, on this point is really that uh, you know digital skills delivery or enhancement it can be a great catalyst it can be great amplifiers but with those things uh, it can always go either way right if you have a sort of um, a situation or precondition where you have certain people who are excluded and um, you know one uses um, digital uh, service delivery 
and is not mindful about, you know, what are those who already have a head start and how those who can take easily advantage of, of this versus others, then it can drive even a bigger wedge between different parts of a society, those who are ac have access, those who are included and those who are excluded. And um, I think um, that's where the challenge lies. And uh, what I was really happy to hear is also from uh, the, 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 the companies who are providing the solutions, how they are taking this very bespoke human-centered design approach. And again, you don't quite know yet what the solution will be. You can think about something on, um, on, on paper or based on other experiences. But as Dave was putting it, like, you know, you might end, you, you start with a sort of uh, a problem that you want to provide a solution, but you don't know whether it's going to be one or whether it's going to be two solutions, whether you can marry the two and how you kind of actually make that um, uh, process happen. And I think that's, there are no shortcuts to that process, right? And as much as we also want to scale different things, um, what I'm also hearing and what I experienced is that, you know, you kind of have to rethink and um, uh, readjust every single time you kind of enter into another ecosystem or another world. And um, I think that's where um, I think the, um, the, the challenge is. But if you're getting it right, um, it, it has enormous potential and it can really be um, a force for, you know, leveling the playing field and, um, you know, like no other way, fast track um, support, whether it's human capital development solutions, whether it's economic solution, then follow up on, on that for businesses, for access to finance and so on. But I think it always starts with the, with the, with the client, with that person we want to support and how do we get that support uh, to that person in, um, in, in, in the best possible way. So, so that uh, I think is, is also my key takeaway there. Thanks. Thank you very much, Raymond. And I appreciate really much what you said. And also, maybe we can say that what you share of the three of you is the idea of having a human-centered product and being able to really know uh, the needs of the beneficiaries and to be there to answer it. And as you said, uh, you have sometimes to rethink your solution and to just adapt to be really close to their needs. And I know that that is what we are all doing together in the Gambia, in Ghana, and in all the country we are working with Dimagi. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for being here with us today. It was very interesting to know more about your solutions, your work, and your idea on uh, digitization and how to give more skills to our beneficiaries. Uh, please just stay with us because we will have a third panel with UNCDF in uh, Western and Central Africa, which will be about cybersecurity and consumer, consumer protection. Thank you very much. Bye.